Everyone, welcome back to another episode of Watch and Listen. Today, we've got our very special guest. You might recognize him. He is so incredibly popular on the YouTubes. Uh, Mr. Nathan Nurswick of Crown and Caliber. He is the resident watch guru of Crown and Caliber. Welcome to the show, Nate. That is, those are fond words. Thank you so much, Mike. Well, I'm very fond of you, so I, I use those fond words. Cameron, how you doing out there, man? I'm doing well. All right. Good deal. Good deal. Today, we are going to talk about a very not so controversial topic, but I guess some people will uh, make it somewhat controversial based on the watches that we pick, because I guess you can. So we're going to do Rolex alternatives, and I'm going to steal your words for a second. You told this off the uh, the, the mic and the, and the camera, uh, Cameron, but you said we're going to look at stuff that is a thousand times or maybe even two thousand times better than your uh, typical Rolex stainless model. Rolex is really difficult to find right now if it's stainless steel in these particular three models. So that'd be the Daytona, be the Submaster, or Submaster, Submariner, <laughs> the Submariner, and any GMT model. Uh, so that's what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at these and a couple of others and have some alternatives for you uh, for you guys. And that way you don't have to spend, aka again, like I'm going to use Cameron's uh, words here, you don't have to spend stupid money and get a much better watch. All right, so you guys ready? We are ready. Oh. All right, good deal. All right, so let's start with uh, the first watch. Uh, probably the most popular watch in the category is the Submariner. So let's take a look at some of the Submariner alternatives. Uh, who got? Who wants to start with one? Who's got one? I will go. I've got right. one, and this is probably the most affordable. And definitely, um, I'd be interested to know from a watchmaker's perspective, Cam, but I'm going to throw in the Seiko Prospects, the Samurai. A prospect samurai. Okay, let's look yeah. at it. Okay, so you're looking at a sub five hundred dollar watch. Okay. Um, as far as the movement goes, I don't think it's anything spectacular. But I, I think love that's it. a good watch. Oh, I, I mean, love. it's it's definitely in a, a very different category of watchmaking. Yeah. Um, but as far as the utilitarian aspect, that's a great dive watch, and it's a good looking watch too. So. Um, I would say if you're going to put something in the Rolex subcategory, uh, I'd go for the spring drive. Hmm. Oh, you're going, yeah. You're, yeah. I yeah. Step up the spring drive, um, which, you know, it's, it's a pricey watch, but it's available right. and it's far less money than a Rolex today. Right. That's yeah. True. Okay, so which, uh, which of the spring drives are we looking at? Because like, it looks like the sport collection is probably the most... Uh, Kind of closest to a Submariner, so let's take a look at that. Yeah, I mean they look, they look, they, they've got that look. I mean, especially this one, the SLG eight A zero zero one. It's a pretty decent, decent looking watch. It, it it's funny because it kind of does have like it's got the turtle case, which is I don't know I. I kind of have this love hate relationship with uh, Grand Seiko. Like for some reason, I can't shake the fact that it's still a Seiko. Yeah, it's really, it, like, I know that I've played with so many of them and the quality is obviously there. They're incredible watches, but it looks so close to, like, a four or $500 watch. And when I'm buying a watch for $11,000, I want it to be a little bit different. You guys, you know, you know what I'm saying? The difference really is in, in having it in your hand. Yeah, it's very hard true. to pull the trigger on a, on a Grand Seiko via the internet. Right, right. Because... That, that does keep popping up is like, well, it's still just a Seiko, you right. know, but as soon as you put it in your hands, it feels superior to, to a Rolex Submariner. Yeah. I mean, and it looks fair. superior with the sweep of that second hand. The well, finishing, yeah. it really yeah. is a, a gorgeous, gorgeous watch. Yeah. I, there's really no other sweep like the, the Grand Seiko for a reason, obviously, because the movement is so incredibly different than a traditional movement. But I guess like the second closest thing would be the El Primero's sweep. It's the thirty six thousand vibrations rather than the twenty eight eight. No, there's there's higher beat watches with uh, with smooth sweeping second hands. Um, I mean, once you get to a certain point, smooth is smooth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it can't get visibly smoother. You know, right? So, uh, but the Grand Seiko is just it's up there because it's a completely different mechanism. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I kind of also struggle with the fact that it is somewhat. You know, it's not fully mechanical, so it does have a little bit of that vibe. But anyway, this isn't about me. But let's let's talk about why you guys picked the Grand Seiko, um, and what the differences are, and what the kind of you know the the, the similarities are 
uh, and, and if there's anything else that we can kind of talk about it. So what do you guys like about this thing? Let's actually, let's go over to the movement and see you know, exactly what makes this whole thing so incredibly different. Uh, actually, Cameron, you're the watchmaker. Explain. <laughs> Well, what would you like me to explain? The spring drive? This thingy right here. Yes, the springy drive. <laughs> well, I mean, the best thing to do is actually to go on their website and read it for yourself. Um, anyone who's interested in a spring drive, Seiko has produced some videos that actually show the way the escapement works and how you have kind of two systems that work together. So it's a, a mechanical watch, but the actual... Uh, the, the movement includes technology that is a little more advanced than your regular, uh, your regular, you have a mainspring running through to the, uh, the escapement, which has your hairspring and those two springs kind of working off together. Mm -hmm. There's a, another additional unit in between those, but still mechanical, as you can see from those pictures on their website. Right. You still have all metal bridges. You still have a mainspring. Uh, you still have a gear train. It, it's still a mechanical watch. Just a new uh, invention. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's like you're taking the traditional movement and you're taking it up a notch, basically. Yeah. So my question to you is this. So I've played around with a bunch of Seikos. And Nate, Nate you know, feel free to chime in at any time. Uh, and I've played with a bunch of Grand Seikos. I've also had like the ability to kind of sort of be around a Rolex movement in the bear and from like someone's like position like mine, for example, basically like a layman that's not a watchmaker. The finishing looks pretty close. You mentioned that, you know, Seiko has better finishing. So can you talk a little bit about that? If you pull up, you know, a, a Rolex movement and then a Seiko, a grand Seiko movement, you'll see to the trained eye, you will see the differences between that Seiko uh, finishing and the very Swiss kind of automated style of finishing that Rolex uses. Right. Both companies are using the highest levels of technology to get this finishing on those movements. Okay. So neither of them are we really talking about a person there doing any kind of hand um, finishing on these movements. It's all going to be as automated as you possibly can get it uh, in order to reach those price points and also that quality. Right. But okay. if you look at the Seiko, it's almost, um, to, to my eye, it appears to be more flawless than Rolex, which almost speaks to their uh perfection of the automated finishing uh machines that they use okay. they've really perfected it i think further than rolex ever has but i don't really know for sure because i haven't seen thousands of them i'm not a not a watchmaker that works on thousands of uh seikos a year thousands of rolexes a year so really the person to to get the good insight would be someone who works on those watches day in, day out and sees the, the different flaws that come across the bench. Okay. So talk about like a typical flaw. What are we going to look at if we're sitting at a bench and we're seeing hundreds of thousands of these parts coming through? I mean, small scratches, small, you know, uh, poor alignment on, on striping and things like that. Weird, uh, weird areas where they don't get the finishing into the bridge in like a corner and things like that. Because this is all, you're talk, it's all automated, right? Uh, so it's all a matter of how well you program the machines and how often you swap out the tooling, mm -hmm. um, and that process is very different than watchmaking. Right. It's really precision manufacturing, and that's what these two companies excel at. Okay. All right. So with that statement, I mean, is it fair to say that Omega has a better finishing process than Rolex as well? Because if you take a look at you know, any Omega product that has a case back display, it looks far more decorated. So is it a matter of just decoration or is it like, is it, does it go further in that? You, you think the tolerances are better for, let's say, Grand Seiko and for Omega than for Rolex? It's not really a tolerance thing. It's really designing for your machines. And I think Seiko does a better job. 
designing um, for your machines. What do you mean by that? I think a Rolex movement looks relatively simple and plain. Right. Whereas a Seiko looks very well decorated. It looks like somebody spent more time designing the look. Right. Okay. Whereas for me looking at a Rolex movement, I think, okay, yeah, I see why they did that. They did that to eliminate an extra step. They did that to, to keep the cost a little bit lower. This seems a little, and it's not a bad thing. It's just, you know, what car do you like to look at? It's probably going to be different than the next person's car that they like to look at. Sure. It's, it's really just my opinion as to what looks nicer to my eye. Uh, it doesn't mean one's better than the other or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. It's I guess the reason they do that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of Seikos, Grand Seikos, have display backs, whereas Rolex doesn't have any models. And if you guys see a Rolex with display back, run. That a not a real Rolex. Uh, unless someone, I think like there are aftermarket companies that do provide case backs, right? That are some. Yeah, kind there's of there's like plenty of companies that make case backs for them. Okay. Uh, you also have to remember that Rolex isn't really designing for that client. Right. Right. You know, they've been around for a long time and they've got, they have a name. And as long as they support that name, they're good. Uh, all these other companies, they're trying to compete with Rolex. Rolex yeah. is not trying to compete with anyone. Yeah, that's true. Rolex is so far and above everyone else. They don't have to pay attention. Yeah. They can just sit up there with their crown on and everybody else tries to say, well, we do this better than Rolex. We do that better than Rolex. But really, nobody does the name game better than Rolex. Right. I see you using those puns. Yeah, those are good <laughs> puns. I did a, we did a video with um, kind of walking through the chronology of the Daytona last year. And we got to open the case back on a Big Red, a Zenith El Primero, and then a Ceramic Daytona. Okay. And looking at the progression of those movements, um, by the 4130 and the ceramic Daytona, it's kind of, I mean, in, in, in every way, it is less beautiful than El Primero, which is like intricate and almost looks like something out of, um, you know, like a steampunk novel. Yeah. And then you get all the way to the, the uh, Alju movement and the Big Red, and you're like, this movement is absurd. It's gorgeous. It's these crazy levers and all these things. But in every way that I would assume, and Cam, I'd love to hear your thoughts. The Valju, whatever it was, 70, 72. 72, 20, I don't Yeah, yeah. Huh? No, I was 72, just say, yeah. yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, pales in comparison to the 4130 in performance, I would assume. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah, by far. So it's, uh, it's performance wise, a, modern day Rolex is, I mean, it's so perfect. But okay. it's not pretty. Yeah, it, and, <laughs> and it wasn't so much designed to be pretty. It's hidden behind a yeah. case back, so people aren't going to see it. Um, so the main goal that I think, and I don't know because I don't, I don't know anyone that works in the design department at Rolex, but as a watchmaker looking at their products, I think that they are designing for reliability mm -hmm. and, uh, and function, really, mm -hmm. function reliability long service life, all of these things that most people would put as their number one priority. Uh, of course, there's the smaller pop smaller population of, you know, watch nuts who want to see the movement. And uh, that is kind of a, they might see a watch as something where movement first, you know, decoration mm -hmm. and beauty first uh, and reliability and low cost on service and all of these other things as a secondary right. item. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, look at the end of the day, Rolex was founded on being a tool, right? It was a tool watch. So they, you got to hand it to them. I mean, they're pretty consistent in their kind of legacy as to what they really are supposed to be. It was just kind of funny when they started producing, you know, precious metals and things like that. It's kind of like deviating somewhat from a plan, but that's really all, you know, precious metals Rolex are. It's just a gold case, and really everything else is pretty much the same. It doesn't really set itself apart, with the exception of maybe, like, the Cellini models, which I've never actually seen in person, uh, and I don't really even know if people buy them and why Rolex still manufactures them, but I don't know. You guys, what do you guys think of those? <laughs> I was... <laughs> um, I think some of the, like, early 90s Cellinis aren't bad. 
I think, and um, <laughs> I think they kind of look like some old Calatropas. <laughs> Back before they went through this, um, oh, there's a Valjoo 72. Yep. Back before they went through this like weird growing pain in the early aughts where they had kind of this like weird integrated case design and the Cellinis were kind of weird. But pre that you had like a 34 millimeter watch with a manual wound movement, which for a modern day Rolex is pretty rare. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, to each their own, but like, you know, a gold 34 millimeter dress watch, not a bad little look. Um, and then the modern, the modern ones, like, a little a little ostentatious for my taste but i mean they're still i think obama wore one of the white gold cellinis so like it's good enough for a president i mean <laughs> that's true i guess yeah but i guess for the most part yeah presidents don't really wear cellinis while they're in office right i think you this was out of office when he was wearing the cellini Something like that, maybe. I don't know who knows. Yeah, I I mean, like, with the exception of maybe Trump, I don't see any president wearing something that, like, that is that extravagant or a Rolex. I mean, most of them are wearing, like, those uh, those watches that are made and you could buy that that are, like, presidential watches or whatever. You know, like, those special edition ones that, ironically, they source from China, but whatever. Oh, it has a presidential seal on it? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. Yeah, well, it's funny. Uh, Like, we talked about not talking about Cellini's, but somehow Cellini, I didn't even think about it. It was, like, a subconscious thing. It just, like, popped into the conversation because it's just such a weird watch in their lineup. I don't understand why they even make it. There's got to be money behind it. I guess. I guess. I mean, Cameron, what are your thoughts on the Cellini? It's a line they can experiment with. Okay. I mean, you're not going to, you're not going to go wild in your Rolex lineup. It's, it's all historical in the Rolex lineup. The, uh, the most mix-up they have is the new Yachtmaster, I think. <laughs> right? I don't know. I think oh, the like the um... same watch, same watch, same watch, and that's good. I think that's very good for resale value. I think that's very good for the identity of a brand. Right. Um, a Submariner is a Submariner, and why should it change every year? There's a lot of watch companies out there that are changing their watch every year. And it doesn't make any sense. You claim that you're making something timeless that's not going to go out of style, yet you have to redesign it every year? Why? Right. So, so I think Cellini is a little more of a line to um, stay hip and stay cool for the, the quick maneuver in that uh, fashion market um, for someone who wants a certain look for a certain occasion, for a certain year, and that's that. You know, it's funny because I think like for the most part, people know the Rolex models. You know, the sport models are so recognizable. So it almost seems like when someone sees a Cellini on someone's wrist, be like, well, that's a fake. That's not a real Rolex. Rolex doesn't make that. And to your point of the cam of it being a testing ground, they released the Moon Phase uh, three or four years ago, which was the first Rolex, new Rolex complication, I guess, since the Yachtmaster 2, probably. The, or yeah. the, maybe, maybe the Skydweller. I don't know. Right. But oh, yeah, 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 the Sky Dweller. Yeah, that's another one. The Sky Dweller is like, whoa, whoa. what is this? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is pretty cool. The indication Rolex? is pretty cool on the Sky Dweller. Um, yeah. But yeah, to that point, I mean, I don't remember the last time. I mean, you have to go back to like, what, a bow dial? I don't, I mean, like, you have to go way back to find a Rolex at the moon phase. So, right. so you guys are talking specifically about movement experimentation, not necessarily like look experimentation because oh, I think look as well. I think he nailed yeah. it on that. Okay. Well, what the hell was Rolex thinking when they thought up this damn thing? The rainbow Dude. Daytona. <laughs> I think they were thinking that we're Rolex and we're going to make something that's extraordinarily limited and people are going to love it. It's also at, the least, third, right? at least one person. Yeah. It's also the I one. Name? There was a, I know there was a white gold version of that that sold like bananas. And uh, I think yeah, that's part is, of. Yeah. I think that's part of Rolex flexing their their prowess and saying, "Hey, look what we can do at scale." Because all those baguette stones are naturally occurring, so they are colored, sorted appropriately. And I think it's something that, like, not a lot of companies are going to be able to, to to produce something like that at scale. You know, right? And so that's a way yeah. they can kind of be like, "Hey, we're Rolex. We can do this." 
and it may be it may be absurd, but it's going to sell. Yeah, and with Rolex, you also have to think about Rolex creating something like that. This is a company that makes a million watches a yeah. year, so them deviating from the normal Daytona or deviating from the normal GMT, whatever model they're choosing to to kind of flex their their gem setting muscles, uh, doing it and having an original Rolex that is set with gems is very special. Yeah. They don't do that often. Um, it increases the value of your Rolex significantly if it was originally made that way. Right. Yeah. So if it came from Rolex with the diamonds in the bezel or, you know, your Submariner came with diamonds in the bezel and, you know, whatever colors of, of diamonds at the 10 markers on the, whatever that makes a huge difference. It makes it extremely rare. It makes it extremely special. Anyone who has money can just take their watch to the Seabold building in Miami or, you know, down to 47th in New York, whatever they can take it there and just throw diamonds on it. No yeah. problem. Just takes money. Yeah. 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 But well, to have Rolex do it and have a certificate from Rolex showing all of that. Very rare. Right. It takes a lot more money. It takes yeah, a lot more money. Yeah. A lot more money. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, I mean, look, we won't. Dr we we've got Daytona coming up, kind of later in the whole uh, talk about uh, alternatives. But we're going to be talking more about the alternatives and not the actual watch. But I, before we continue, I just wanted to show you guys this because, in my opinion, this is the biggest Rolex disaster piece ever. You guys ready for it? I'm calling it Platinum Daytona. No, I love the Platinum oh. Daytona. It's the Leopard Dial. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this it's thing a, is comical in how bad it is. I mean, it's it unbelievably looks like a, bad. Is that a Pearl Master bracelet? It looks, yeah, it's a Pearl Master bracelet. Wolf. And I don't, I, this looks factory. I, th I think, yeah, it's on Rolex watches. So this is, I mean, this is just, this is something else. Oh, we're not going to go on this website. Uh uh. Now we're going to get out of here. <laughs> You get out of here. This unnamed website that we're not going to talk about that's not sponsoring the show. Get out of here. But I think I think even to Cam's point, it's like I remember when the the rainbow came out that you were showing. Okay, repeat that because you were kind of breaking years up there. Ago, and like, oh, I was saying I remember when the Rolex Daytona rainbow came out a few years ago. Yeah, the gem set crazy one you just had on screen. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing the images and thinking. Oh my God, what has Rolex done? <laughs> and not knowing that there was, there was a previous white gold model. Right. And then starting to read the, the press and publicity about it and how people are losing their damn minds. And I was like, wait, what did I miss? And so then you have to kind of go back through the history and see, Oh, like Cam said, like they're flexing a muscle that is super rare and people lose their minds over it. And I may not, I, mean, I can appreciate it now because I'm, more learned in the history of why people would care about it. But I look at it and I'm like, hell no, I don't want that. Same with the leopard. But that doesn't mean that people don't want it or aren't going to pay for it, which is absurd. Right. But are you in the class of people like, like I'm in this class? Like I don't, if I'm buying a Rolex, I don't want any, anything on it other than it being like, I'm like a Rolex purist, I guess. I don't want any precious metals. I mean, obviously with the Submariner, if you buy it, you're still going to have the gold, white gold indices. So you're, you're, but most people don't even know that those are white gold. Like I recently mm -hmm. found that out just, you know, a few years ago. Uh, but yeah, I guess I'm in the camp of like, if I'm buying a Rolex, I don't want any damn diamonds on it. I just want a Rolex. That's, that's a, uh, that's a big Debate. can of worms. Yeah. I think that I mean, the ethos of what, what you attribute to a brand right whether or not it's is the ethos of the brand is a separate conversation sure in and of itself okay fair all right we won't get too <laughs> controversial on this episode guys all right so uh let's discuss something else here so we're we're still on the submariner so any other alternatives or should we continue on to the next rolex watch i mean i think you do have to talk about a planet ocean okay yeah that's fair like that is widely available. I mean, you could you could throw in a number of watches. You could say, well, we need to look at the Blanc on 50 Fathoms. We should also look at a Bad Escape. We should look at, you know, I don't know. You can name, like I said, plenty. But I think, like, like in the front, what people are going to think about is, well, what about Omega? Yeah. And start to look at the Planet Ocean. And that's a perfect example, like you said, Cam, a company that releases 
seemingly a new model or a new version every year. Um, Cause I think the current planet ocean comes in two sizes and I think it's actually a little smaller than its previous iteration from a few years back. I think the current one is 39.7 and maybe 43. Yeah, 43.50, which is a weird case size. Okay, so yeah, it's 39.5 and 43.5. So So you have something that's literally, I mean, that's basically mimicking a Submariner and a Sea Dweller. Right. So like they're squarely going after those two watches. Um, so I'd love to, yeah. to Cam weigh in on the what movement's that the eighty eight hundred coaxial. Uh, I mean, it, it depends on the year of the Planet Ocean. Let's that's another most, thing that's going to change a lot. Uh, uh, um, trying to find the current one. But if if you're talking about current, then you're talking about a movement that is far superior to the Rolex in my mind. Yeah. Um. It has multiple things going for it as far as uh, on that movement. I believe it's uh, anti-magnetic escapement. Which one is this? It's, correct, right? it's the, yeah, okay. So Omega Master Chronometer 8900. 8, it has the meta status. Yeah. So yeah, that's. So basically what they're doing is they're, instead of putting a shield on the movement, um, like most anti-magnetic watches, they actually re-engineered the components of the movement hmm. that are affected by magnetism. Oh, that's cool. So they changed the materials so that they are no longer affected by a magnet. Right. That's so funny. they can have the open case back and still have a, an anti-magnetic movement. Uh, but you've also got this coaxial escapement in there. Right. So the amount of technology and, and watchmaking going into that movement is... I think beyond what, what Rolex brings to the table right now in the Submariner. Right. Uh, even the current Submariner that has their, you know, the, the Parachrome and, and these trademark things that they put in their watch, they're not significantly different from previous watches, at least not that much. It's just a trademark name. Yeah. Um, it's the beauty of having the best name, right? You don't have to yeah. have the highest performing product. Yeah. Hey, so yeah. Cameron, quick question based off of what you just said. So with, with, with the materials is, so we're looking at the movement right now. Let me see if I can zoom in. There we go. So that balance, the black, what, why, why is the balance black here on this uh, 8901? Uh, just to differentiate it. It's okay. a, I believe it's a silicon balance. Silicon. Okay. Got it. Okay. Silicon balance wheel, silicon hairspring. Um, I, I don't know what other materials they're, they're using in there. Right. But that's the main place you're going to see an issue is going to be in your hairspring when you've got magnets. Sure. Got it. Yeah, I mean, look, let's 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 just take a really give me just any modern Rolex caliber. Thirty-one thirty-five. Thirty-one thirty-five. Trusty old thirty-one thirty-five. Okay, so let's just take a look at the thirty-one thirty-five compared to the Omega. That's what's in the Submariner. Right, so here we go. I'm just trying to find a good website for us to take a look at because all these other websites I do not like. Here we go, blog to watch. That's a reliable source. 3135 watch movement. Yeah, you can't compare the level of aesthetic finishing. There to, it is. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's... If you're looking at them side by side, the Rolex is basically just like, it's a utilitarian thing. It doesn't, if you take a look at it and let's say like a Miyota, with the exception of obviously the, the striping and, and the higher quality finishing on it, it doesn't look that much more impressive. But if you take a look at the 89, it's just, it's day and night. It's a huge, huge difference. I mean, this looks like a movement that you could easily stick into a really, really expensive piece. We're talking like 30, 40 grand. And it'll fit in there just right. But if you have the 30, um, 3135 in a watch that is in that price range and it's got a display back, you can be like, what is this? Why is this in this watch? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, even to that point, you should Google the 3235 because that is the newest iteration okay. of the date complication. And it is in the newer date just 36 and i think they released it in the sea dweller so that is effectively the movement that will end up in the submariner date um 
in the coming years. Right. And even the 32, 35 is going to look still very similar. It's going to look like, a, you know, like not that vastly different yeah. from the 31, 35. And that right. is, that is as modern as a Rolex movement gets right now. 31, 35, 31, where'd the 32 go? Okay. So I don't know if anyone else sees this when they look at the, the latest Rolex movements, but I see Tudor. What do you mean? Oh, so I know people don't necessarily love when I, uh, talk about, uh, Tudor movements and how they're, it's designed to be inexpensive. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and I see that coming through on the new Rolex movements design wise to me, the language looks like Tudor, but souped up a little bit. Right. Uh, yeah, with yeah, some extra decoration, some finer polishing, some finer beveling, uh, some gold engravings, things like that. Uh, but to me, that screams Tudor. Yeah. For your car, for you, all you car people, it's like, think about this. Like you have a Toyota and you have a Lexus. They might be using the same engine. I mean, the same engine block, just obviously tuned different. But if you open up the same engines on two different cars, you've got the Toyota on the left and Lexus on the right. The Lexus is probably going to have some kind of plastic pieces to cover it. And it's going to have like an engine cover that says Lexus on it. Whereas Toyota is just going to say Toyota and maybe some other junk on it. So that's kind of, I don't know. Am I, am I right in that comparison or is it kind of not so great? I don't know. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the easiest place to see it with Tudor is going to be look at any Breitling. <laughs> okay. I think Breitling knocks the finishing game out of the park. Right. Compared to Tudor. Well, let's look. Because I mean, that's, that's an alternative. Because that's more of their brand. Breitling mm -hmm. is focused on that traditional look and achieving that and having a display case back. That's very important to Breitling. Do you have a movement for uh, reference for me for not Breitling? Important. Not important to have a... Um, I don't really know the Breitling B03, I think would have been or the B01. Either B01 one of those. Yeah. yeah, the B01. Exactly. That's a shared movement Okay. Uh, in there. But if you look at the, the Tudor version and the Breitling version, oh, yeah. it looks... I think most people would agree that Breitling is doing a better job decorating that movement yeah. than Tudor is doing. And, and, and I say better job, but that's really the wrong way to say it. Uh, uh, they're more focused on that because their price points are higher for the mm -hmm. watches they're going into. Uh, so they do have to present more value, which is being done in the finishing sure. and also the history of the brand. Uh, whereas Tudor is more focused on providing a, a, a less expensive version uh, with larger production numbers and really trying to, to master that volume production and no open case back. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right. in ahead. case you missed that, my Tudor and Breitling co-orchestrated, created a movement. So right. that, if it's the B01, the equivalent, if you want to look it up, would be the caliber MT5813. Caliber so that effectively, I think, is the same MT5. movement. Um, yeah, same, Tudor. same place. MT5 they work together. They work together on uh, a couple movements. Mm -hmm. So they have a, a, a regular time only automatic with date, I think. And then they've got a, the chronograph movement that they jointly make. Uh, and obviously once the, the base has been machined and all the parts have been machined uh, from whatever design they're using, they then kind of separate and they end up with a different product. Hey, Nate, what was that reference number again? MT5 what? Um, Is it 602? <laughs> I got 602, 612, 601. MT5, I don't know, I closed it. 813. 813, okay. Nate with the reference numbers. Man, you're good. That's why he's <laughs> on the show. I can't, I can't remember reference numbers for the life of me. Yeah, I, neither can I. I uh, there we go. <laughs> my wife is like, how... Yeah, why? Why is that? <laughs> yeah. stuff? I like that. Why? Yeah, it looks pretty similar. I mean, look, the Tudor movement looks pretty good. They've got that little frosting thing going on. It looks good. I like it. Oh, I, I have. I don't say they don't look good. Just it's a different style, right. Of mm -hmm. a decoration, right? 
Yeah. I mean, look, it, it makes sense. If it's not going to be front and center and on display, you don't need to put that much money into it. I, I don't see the reason to go in and hyper decorate it because that's not really what they are. You know, with brands like Breitling and Omega and other brands you know, like JLC, for example, there all of these movements, well, not all of them, but a lot of them are on display. So they kind of have to have that look. They have to look better. It's like, you know, when you're looking at these kind of, uh, what are they called? Like micro brands or whatever. And they come out of nowhere and they're like, yeah, we're going to charge you a thousand or 1500 bucks for this really high quality watch. And just a base at a, and there's no decoration on it whatsoever. It's basically just like, they took it from Etta, plopped it in there. And they're like, yeah, this is a highly decorated, beautiful Swiss movement, but it's just so bare and, and ugly. I'm like, dude, just close it. Don't show it. Just say, yeah, yeah. there's a really good movement in there. It's a workhorse, but don't put it on display, especially if there's no decoration on it. It's, it just doesn't make any sense. It, it ain't no Weiss watch, I'll, I'll tell you that. It has to do with your audience. Yeah, yeah I guess. Who's your buyer? Yeah. You know? If it's a, a $1,000 watch, you're, you're aiming after someone who's probably buying a Shinola or something of that accord. And yeah. the idea of being able to flip over the watch and see the fact that there is a movement is a revelation. What the hell does shoe exactly. polish have to do being with this? Being able to witness the balance wheel going back and forth. Yeah. If, if that's your first mechanical watch, then that's beautiful enough to see that balance wheel right. just, you know, doing its thing. Okay, look, uh, buy a Seiko, and you are, <laughs> it's like, okay, but anyway, that's, that's not the discussion that we're having today. So should we go on to the next watch? Should we do some other alternatives? Yeah. Okay, go. right, okay. I'm going to take out my trusty notepad. Let's do <laughs> Daytona, what are we doing, Daytona or GMT? What do you guys want to do first? Let's jump into the Tony. You want to do the Tony? Okay. All right. I've never Let's, heard the Daytona be called the Tony before. That is a new one. I like it. We, we in the office, when we would see fake Daytonas, we'd call them phony Tonys. Oh, okay. All right. I can see where the reference is coming from. All right. So let's talk about the Daytona, the beautiful, beautiful Daytona. One of my favorite watches of all time, if not my favorite watch of all time. And Nate, you had a little bit of a video that you posted up not too long ago, somewhat controversial in my opinion, because you said something. What did you say? I basically said that I think Daytona has lost its way. I think if you look at Rolex and what Hans, Hans Wilsdorf he had his like three pillars of the brand and I, I don't know them. Someone could look them up, but I think it was, and you hit on him, Cam. I think it was like reliability, durability, and accuracy maybe. Right. And I mean, if you're paying 20 grand for a $10,000 watch, it kind of misses the mark. And so I said that the Omega Speedmaster, the CK2998 to me is a better watch. Omega CK2998. Let's try and find it. CK2998. Yeah, 2998. Yeah. Okay. It, it was the nice. first Omega in space. Right. So you have like milli millimeter for millimeter, the same case as the Wally Sergio watch. Um, and specifically that one with the red hand, the pulse meter. Uh huh. I, that's the, the most recent limited edition. Here's why this watch is great. Same case as a watch that's I don't know from the 60s it's amazing it kind of harkens back to the original Speedmaster so you get straight lugs you give up the crown guards mm -hmm. you get the um, 1861 manual wound Speedmaster caliber so you get kind of the, the stalwart of the Speedmaster line as it stands um, heresy as it may be it has a sapphire crystal day to day wear it's gonna it's gonna be more hard wearing that one has a ceramic bezel so again a little bit more hard wearing it's got this like frosted white dial um and so i think in every way even this is a limited edition so it's going to be above retail probably but you're looking probably five to seven thousand i don't know yeah. you know a fraction of the cost um for a manual wound chronograph movement that is is a limited edition so it's numbered to less than three thousand um Okay. And I think it's just like, I think it's a great watch. Even if you don't get the limited edition, I mean, that's like, you can find those pre-owned well under three grand and you've got a chronograph. You've got something that's closely tied to history, but is okay with some modern accoutrement. And then this, like one of my least favorite things about the Daytona is that a lot of the cases are not symmetrical. <laughs> 
And I mean, that just drives me up the wall. And I guess if you had a Speedmaster, it would be asymmetrical, but it, it, it kind of plays to the design. But right. if you look at the, the 2998 Speedy, at first Omega in space, that's a symmetrical case. And so I, I don't know, that kind of just like, I, I prefer that. And maybe, and I, then I'll stop. And maybe if every day <laughs> Maybe if every Daytona was not symmetrical, I would say, oh, that was like, okay, like that's just part of the design. But you'll see like some of the precious metal, the the swoop for the pushers is symmetrical to the, the nine o'clock case side. Mm-hmm. So they do it in some of the Daytonas, but they don't do it in the stainless steel. And I, I, I'm sure there's some manufacturing process that I'm just not privy to. But God, man, that's like, and I mean, if you haven't seen it and you're watching this, just go Google this, the, the Daytona, go look at the awesome. six o'clock logs, look at the nine o'clock and the three o'clock. They're not the same like rake. They're not the same angle to the case. You'll never see it the same again. I've ruined the Daytona for countless people. I hope. Um, <laughs> you hope. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm done. I think it's so overhyped. Okay, well, I mean, that's a fair assessment. Let's take a look. So, let's pull up a stainless steel. You and you're talking about stainless steels. Here's one. Let's pull it up on the interwebs here. Okay. Oh my gosh! Look how bad it is. <laughs> I, uh, it's, it's not that bad. <laughs> it's not that I mean, bad. I say, are you are you like a OCD when it comes to symmetry? Um. Uh, no, not necessarily. It, but here's the thing: go look at some of. I mean, it is it is noticeable when you see it. Am I am when I, you point it out? Yeah, absolutely. You can't not see that. <laughs> okay. But then start looking at some of the precious metal ones. Like, go pull up the. I think the 50th anniversary, the platinum with the ice blue dial. Okay. I. That may be one of them, or maybe it's in white gold. But you start to look at some of the precious metals, and they don't have it. And I thought for sure. My eyes were deceiving me, and I had to go to the watchmakers and get two watches and for sure measure it. And for sure, some of the precious metal don't have the same taper on the pusher sides. Right. So they're, they're, they are symmetrical. Okay. All right. Which I, don't, I just don't, it just doesn't make sense. Does it have to? <laughs> I mean, this entire hobby sometimes doesn't make sense. We're spending thousands and thousands of dollars on something that is not even that accurate, you know, in comparison to, let's say, like an iPhone or an Apple Watch or something like that. It's just, it, it does, doesn't have to make sense for it to be cool. That's true. I, I want to I wanna know what Cameron thinks about <laughs> everything I just said. He's just sitting there. I So I think, uh, and I don't know because I've, I, was never you know a watchmaker at rolex but my thoughts on it are that they didn't do it because they thought it looked good yeah uh they did it to work out tooling and design differences between certain models when they have slightly different pushers uh and that's why you'll see it with the precious metals and what you're dealing with i think is access to the pushers okay uh for either change in, in design so that the pushers can be manufactured in a different way uh, or also attaching the pushers to the case. Okay. Hmm. All right. Well, there's so a lot. I think makers. that's the reason behind it. It's a, it's a slight engineering difference uh, and it was not necessarily the, what they were looking for design wise in the look of the watch yeah here's a comparison let's see if we can kind of pull it up oh it's a youtube video nope no bueno not gonna do it so let Ooh. okay well I, we can kind uh, of sort of see it there it is right here i just yeah i i agree with you i don't think it was a conscious design choice but rather a A byproduct of the manufacturing i just yeah. wish i wish it were something that had been thought about 
right. Let's uh, let's write a strongly worded letter to Rolex. Have them retool everything, and the new stainless steel models they'll be doing uh, the way that you prefer them, Nate. So, all right, let's do another let's do another alternative here. So we've got the Omega CK two two network two was it two what? man, I'm so terrible Which at references. I think is a great alternative as well to the guys, yeah. the Daytona. The one <laughs> the one thing I want to mention that makes the Daytona a great watch the current Daytona is an automatic chronograph movement made by the company that is selling the watch. Yeah. That is something that is so rare in the industry to have an automatic chronograph that is made by the watch company. Right. Um, so that to me, that's the one thing that if, if someone is wearing a, a Daytona, that's the one reason I wouldn't say, well, you overspent mm -hmm. is if that is their reason that they wanted an automatic chronograph from the maker, yeah. then you get a pass, you know, but if, if it's just, well, I wanted a Daytona, I don't know if I like that reasoning for spending so much more money to get that Daytona. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, look, I, to me, it's like it is the quintal, quintessential chronograph. If you really think about historical chronographs, you're thinking about Daytona and you're thinking about the Speedmaster, right? And to me, this, the Speedmaster, I don't know, for some reason, Omega watches don't do it for me. I don't know why. Uh, even even if they have the coaxial, which I think is like the most... I know why they don't ever. do it for you. Why? One thing, the name, Omega. <laughs> No, actually, it's, it's not, not the Rolex name. Rolex that doesn't have a crown. No, you know what? It's actually not. So one of the things that I, I kind of like the thing about Rolex is the Rolex case and just the Rolex build and just, I don't know, there's just, there's just got like a feel to Rolex and there's no other watch that feels like a Rolex. Like there are two different brands that I, that I think that like just have a different type of feel. That's Rolex and then Patek. When you're holding a Patek versus, let's say, like a VC, there's something different about it. It's not a matter of finishing. It's not a matter. I, I don't even know what it's a matter of, but it's just a feel that you get when you're wearing it and when you when you're holding it. Like to me, like the, the I think it's the crown. If you say so, you you, you <laughs> have the right to an opinion. <laughs> I politely disagree. Yeah, I think it is definitively preconceived notion. It could be a subconscious yeah. thing. Could be. Uh, I, I, I agree. I and think I, the, the more watches you hold in your life, the the less that Rolex name and crown will hold uh, in your preconceived values mm -hmm. uh, of the timepieces. So it's really just a matter of visiting as many stores as you can, meeting <laughs> with as many collectors as possible, and eventually that crown will start to come down a notch and the playing field will level out and then you can look at these watches a little more, uh, um, I don't know, with more and you can really like pick apart the Rolex watch for well, what it really is. Yeah, logic. Guess, basically, okay. Yeah. Let me, share, let me share with you a quick anecdote from this weekend. I'll make this brief. Okay. So I love Negronis. It's my favorite <laughs> cocktail. And I've been drinking them for an excess of a decade now. So I've had quite a few Okay. and I got this wild hair during, during quarantine that I was going to go buy like the top five or six Italian vermouths batch make Negronis <laughs> with everything the same other than the vermouths and do a double blind taste taste test to see then if I could analytically go through and say, I taste this, I taste this, I taste this, this one's more sweet. This is more bitter rank them and then pick my least favorite through my favorite. And even in doing that, I could not separate what I tasted and thought the brand was from how I ranked it. So in the sense, I thought one that I tasted, I was like, Oh, that's for sure. This from I, the, the preconceived notions came in. I don't like that vermouth as much. I, I ranked it lower on the list, even though I liked the, the flavor more. I, I didn't want to rank it as high. And guess what? I was wrong. It wasn't the vermouth I thought. So like there's probably all kinds of lessons to be learned, but I think preconceived notions and marketing and branding cannot, even when you try to remove it from your analytical decision, cannot be removed. Fair. That's fair. Yeah. That's fair. And so. I, I think the only way to temper that is really 
by seeing and holding and handling as many watches as possible to really see what it's all about. And you start to see that most most watches from a reputable company uh, where they're really trying their best to, to make a good product, they're going to be relatively similar in feel. Uh, similar, yes, but different. And, and, you know, Rolex, a lot of it is the name. Oh, without question, uh, that yeah. That makes people think that the Submariner is the best dive watch or the Daytona is the best chronograph. I think, as far as chronographs go, uh, Breguet. I think if you go with the Breguet, uh, what is it, the uh, the Type 20 or whatever, the Aero, Aero Naval. I think I know which one, the XX model? Yes. Okay. Let us take so if a you, look. If you were to look at that watch, now here's a, a, a watch of mine that I would love to collect. I would love to have one of these. It's beyond my financial realm right now. But if you are a Daytona buyer, then you should highly consider trying to find one of these because this is the original watch in platinum with an automatic chronograph movement. There was a platinum version made of the original and you can find them for like 10 to 15 grand with boxes and papers mm -hmm. in platinum. Okay. And I, and I'm going to chime in here. I'm going to chime in. Those lugs seem symmetrical. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let me tell you guys what I think about this watch. Uh, I think it's a great watch. But I hate the font. I the, the Breguet font is just no, I don't like it. And that just kind of ruins it for me. And also like this kind uh, of Are you talking out. about the font? Are you talking about the logo or are you talking about the numerals? The uh, the logo. And actually, yeah, you know what? The numerals, now that you pointed out, what is a Breguet without Breguet numerals? What's going on here, guys? I don't know. So don't know. this is with with Breguet, you can't really talk about like Breguet numerals and Breguet hands and all this stuff. It's not Breguet. Breguet was an old man who made beautiful <laughs> watches uh, and from the old days of watchmaking there were quite a few counterfeits of Breguet. Okay. It actually makes me steer clear of any antique Breguet hmm. because there were so many counterfeits of his watches. Interesting. I uh, that. You would not believe the number of times people have brought me a pocket watch and said, I have this, this Breguet and I get all excited and thinking, Oh, it's a Breguet. And it, <laughs> it never is. It's always a counterfeit because this stuff is so rare. Uh, and there were just so many people fake. And it doesn't mean that the fake is of, of poor quality because at that time it was still a, probably a master master watchmaker making this fake simply because somebody else had a name that could help sell this watch. That's crazy. Uh, it was not a cheap way of doing it. It cost them the same amount of money to make it and the same amount of same number of hours to make it as it took Breguet. <laughs> but their name was worthless. It had no value to it. So they put the Breguet name on it. Very, okay. very odd to me, but uh, it was a very different time back then. Yeah, that is really but anyway, weird. Breguet from that period and Breguet today it's completely different in my mind. Okay. Well, I mean, look, that's fair. That's all I got to say. Um, I do have a watch that I think is a little underrated and is a very, very good alternative to a Daytona. And then I have another one, which is super controversial. And it's actually in my possession. Now, obviously, if you guys follow me on the Instagrams, you probably know what I'm going to be talking about. Um, but if you don't, at Road Stories Mike, give me a follow. And you'll see what I'm talking about. But first, let's talk about the non-controversial one. Let's pull it up here on the Crown and Caliber website. Boom. The Master Control. It's a Jaeger or Zhejie, right? I mean, that's, that's, I think that's the proper pronunciation. I, I guess it depends on where you're coming from, like which part of Switzerland you're coming from. This is always like a, a topic of conversation amongst... Watch nerds, JJ or Jaeger, I don't know, whatever. We but, had a we had a video on JLC a while ago, and man, I got lambasted. <laughs> and 
I, I mean, one guy had the wherewithal to comment and be like, well, he used a pretty Western pronunciation of the brand. I was like, well, yeah, we're in America. Like, yeah. just got lambasted for it. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. So just yeah, say, we, are, yeah. we are speaking English. We are not speaking French. So, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a, a big part of it. But also, uh, I have gauges in my car that were not made in Switzerland. Oh, okay. So it does not have to be French. It can also be English. Right. Or there's the Germanic pronunciation too, where, you know, you have the hard, uh, yeah. the J's. So yeah, whatever currently, people... currently JLC is located in a French speaking region. Okay. In Switzerland. So uh, the JJ pronunciation okay. would be better or, or more correct. No, we're, we're speaking English. Okay. Jager Le Culture. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the worst uh, worst pronunciation I've heard. I'll take if you want that. to see a worse one, if you want to see a worse one, just go watch the first fifteen seconds of that video on our our channel. I'll I'll give you a run for your money there, Mike. Send us a yeah, send us the link. What what I'll do is I'll put the link up on the uh, the the, <laughs> the video here and then you guys can go and have fun with it. It's funny, like if we're talking pronunciation, so I think one of the first episodes that we did uh, when we were talking about uh, certifications and we were talking about Paddock, when I said Paddock, people went nuts. They're like, you can't say Paddock. It's Patek. I'm like, well, I guess I could say whatever it is that I want because this is a gosh darn free country and I'm an American. So it is what it is. Yeah. Right. So yeah. anyway, uh, let's go back to the ZZ and talk about the master control. So here's why I like this watch. Number one, it has a similar aesthetic to the Daytona. Uh, the dial is pretty gosh darn busy, like the Daytona's dial. Uh, it is kind of difficult to read. So if you're looking for a pretty like close comparison and an actual feel too, like this watch actually really yeah. feels like the Daytona. It's got just as crappy of a display. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I, as a an avid Daytona fan, I take offense to that. That is that's not cool, man. That's not I, cool. I'm just I don't feel that uh, that Daytona is as hard of a watch to read as as many people feel, but I do think that that is a criticism they get often. Yeah, flexibility is not not really great on those watches. Yeah, but I, go ahead to that point. Uh huh. I think, and this is one of my coworkers, Jonathan, first mentioned this to me. But he's like, the idea of people saying, "Oh, I don't like that watch because it's busy." Well, busy is your own interpretation and if you haven't spent time with a nava timer it's going to appear busy that doesn't yeah. inherently mean that it is difficult to read in the same sense a daytona may be considered busy by someone's standards but if you're coming from a nava timer a daytona is not going to seem busy no not at all i think i think in the the canvas that the daytona is on it is highly legible for what it is Okay, and I, I do think that uh, people gravitate towards a chronograph because they want busy, they yeah. want more going on on the dial. Time only is a little simple and plain, yep. uh, whereas a chronograph can be a little more sporty and aggressive and, and more going on. Yeah, when people uh, when people have a Daytona, they want someone to say what time is it, and they want to pull out their phone and be like, oh, it's uh, yeah, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Craziness. This is absolutely. I, I don't know. I agree with you guys. I think more is gooder. More is gooder. All right, so should we uh, look at the uh, controversial thing that we have here? Oh, show us the show it to us. I know what okay. it is. Here we go. Uh, so you guys have been complaining, those who have uh, been listening to the show, that we don't show enough watches. Well, we finally have a watch to show, and we finally have our little trusty watch camera back. So here it is, the Ublo, with the correct uh, pronunciation, which is not focusing. Come on, focus. All right, well, anyway, this is the classic Fusion 45 millimeters. And I think it's actually not a bad Daytona alternative. If it can autofocus, what is going on here? Let's try to see if we can get it to autofocus. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay, button. Button worked, and we are at autofocus. All right, so gentlemen, what do you think about my choice? Whoops. Oh, boy. <laughs> What's the, All right, explain your oh, boy. Because, uh, you know, obviously that's kind of a, a broad statement. You know, mm, mm, I, mm, <laughs> I don't know. I, there's a lot of things I could say. I think it, some of it's unfair because it's preconceived notions because I put up a, a manual on chronograph. So I see it and I'm like, well, it's a two register chronograph for starters. It's, you know, an integrated case. 
Um, You're speechless. I like it. I like when controversy makes people speechless. I think, I think that this brand has a really interesting um, image that they've put out there of themselves. That's one way of putting I, it. I believe that they have a lot of watchmaking ability, which, which uh, most people don't even really, it doesn't factor into their purchase. Um, they have an amazing integrated movement uh, design company and manufacturing company that is within their group. They really could do anything that they put their minds to doing. Um, and I do think that they have some great designs, but I find that a lot of their watches don't really speak to me personally. Uh, that being said, I absolutely love their dive watch, even though it's way too big for my wrist. I think it's the coolest looking thing ever. Which one is this? Uh, I, it's like, I, I think it could go through the earth. That's how deep it can go. <laughs> it's like a beast. It is a beast to watch. Uh, I think I found it. It kind of looks like a Ploprof a little bit. Here we go. Uh, yeah, Let's it has a again. huge, like, uh, a huge protruding. Yeah, there you go. Jesus, okay. It's got the internal bezel, but it's got these <laughs> big, beefy knobs. It's like, it's so overbuilt. Is it a 4,000 meter? I think so. It's yeah, something. Yeah, it says 4,000 meter on there. Yeah. And I've actually, I've held this watch. I've had it on my wrist. I think it is so cool. Yeah. But again, it's just, it's, it's too large for me. And at the time that I uh, tried this watch on, I wore the Audemars Piguet uh, dive watch, which is a big watch mm. on its own. And this one felt way too big. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah, well, this is a monstrosity, in my opinion. I don't like the way that it looks, especially in the carbon fiber. That looks oh, ridiculous. I don't know about that carbon fiber, but I, I think that that design language for that watch that you see in the Diver 4000, uh -huh. that's what the whole Big Bang line should be. I yeah. do not agree okay. with the with the polishing and the cut trying to make it dressy. It just doesn't fit with that watch to me. Okay. All right. I mean, that's a fair, that's a fair statement here. here. I'll tell you guys why I chose this. Number one, I like controversy and I like stirring things up. So I thought this would be a fun watch as the first watch because, you know, in my previous endeavors as being a podcast host uh, for, of, of a show called on time, we blew like no pun intended. We blew up you blow. So we were super critical of it until uh, I actually was able to talk to someone by the name of Mike Margolis who was on the show. If you guys haven't watched the show with him, please do. It was a really, really fun show, and he is supremely knowledgeable, and he's been in the industry for the longest time. So I talked to Mike, and I was like, hey, Mike, you know, what's the deal here? Why did you choose to work for Ublow, and why did you know, JCB actually think that this was going to be something that he would be able to do? And he said this, I mean, look, if you were looking at materials, Ublow has got it. I mean, they are really, really pushing the envelope on materials. And I think that some of the things that, kind of set watches apart are materials. Uh, and I think the materials in, in themselves are not given enough credit because the, the, like the materials that are using are space age in, in some of these watches like that carbon fiber. I mean, it looks terrible, but it is pretty damn impressive to create a case out of carbon fiber and the dry carbon and all that good stuff. And we're talking like space age technology and formula one technology. And this watch in particular kind of sort of, works in the same way that someone wearing a Daytona would kind of use. I mean, let's put it this way. I put a post up on my Instagram and I said, hey, what would you wear? Would you wear a day date or I'm not sorry, a date just two or this watch? And here's the kicker. You're driving a white Ferrari in Miami. Like what, which of the two are you going to wear? And almost all of the people chose this watch. And for every watch, there's a purpose and there's a purpose for every watch. So I thought that, you know, like, hey, if you were going to, where if you're driving a white Ferrari, you probably have a Daytona in your collection. It's probably there. And it's probably a chocolate Daytona or just a regular stainless steel. One of those two, nothing else. So I just decided to throw it in there. But it is a pretty damn well built watch. I mean, if you haven't played with a Ublow before, you should. Of the LVMH brands, I think actually this one has some of the better build quality. Like tags are, they're built well. They're not, 
you know, built poorly by any stretch of the imagination. And Zenith is built really well as well. But I, I'll tell you, so my brother has a Zenith El Primero, the Charles Vermont that I got him. And I actually think that the Hublot is built better. And it's kind of surprising, you know, because you would think that Zenith would have better finishing, better quality materials. It looks like they use a lot of similar materials and they probably scale their economies in, in terms of like using their, uh, like, I guess, like maybe cases or something like that. They probably have the same manufacturers that supply them parts. Am I right to say that, Cameron? Or do you not know? Uh, I don't know about those two brands offhand, but uh, the majority of everything is going to be. You know, you, you will find that everything crosses over. Right. It's, don't find brands that are insulated from everyone else. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, look, it's this, this whole like topic of discussion is about us having fun, and I thought this was a way for us to have some fun and stir up some, uh, some waters here. So, okay, like, we've talked about uh, most of the alternatives. Do you guys have anything else that we, we've talked about, or should we continue on to the next one? which I think is going to be the most fun because there are a lot of really, really good alternatives to GMTs. Before we do, I want to throw in um, one more just bonus pick because the watch doesn't exist yet, but the sum of its parts do. Okay. So go ahead and look up the Omega Caliber 3861. Omega Caliber 3861. So they released this um, Ooh, that's last pretty. year, and they released it in the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 Moonshine Gold Watch. Now, what's great about this movement, and it came to mind, that, is that it? Yeah, that's yeah. what it looks like, yeah, 3861, uh, yep. They released this movement in that watch, and I thought of this because, granted, it's still not an automatic, but I think one of the big drawbacks to the just 1861 Speedmaster movement mm -hmm. is it's not highly accurate. And this is basically the next iteration of the 1861. So this has the coaxial statement. It has um, the silicon balance spring. It is, has the meta certification and is resistant to 15,000 Gauss. So okay. this movement in every way is a modern day manual wound chronograph movement. I think it's a safe assumption, maybe not in the moonshine gold, but I think we will see that movement trickle down into the standard Speedmaster. Okay. All right. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be cool. It's, I agree. It's only, it seems to me only a logical next step. So now you're looking at, granted, it's still a manual on versus an automatic, but you're looking at a Speedmaster that has a movement that is every bit as accurate, if not more accurate, than a 4130 in a Daytona. Okay. Um, so... We'll see it one day, I'm sure. I but it's hopefully. definitely something I'm excited about. Cool. All right. So, should we carry on to GMTs? Yeah. Onward. All right. Let's do it. Onward. All right. So, obviously, we're comparing the Rolex GMT to watches that are a great alternative. So, let's pull up a Rolex GMT for you guys that have no references to what it looks like. I highly doubt that you don't, but let's pull it up. Yeah, anyway. if you don't know what a Rolex GMT looks like, then chances are you're not interested in yeah. this. <laughs> yeah, get off the show. Stop oh, listening yes. right away. Get out of here. All right, so <laughs> a lot of white gold models and a lot of not white gold models. Okay, so this is the Rolex GMT, Old Faithful. Some of the blueberries, some of the... Let's pull up... Actually, th this is a cool one. I like the blueberry, the, the vintage blueberry with the solid blue bezel. Those are cool. But I guess we won't talk about that. We're, we're talking about contemporary GMTs here. So. Yeah, we're talking about a Pepsi bezel, Rolex GMT. Let's see and if Pepsi. you're at all thinking about getting one, we're just kind of saying, maybe don't. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay, so if we're talking about maybe don't, what are we, what are we uh, subbing out for the GMT? What's our first choice? Well, first, I probably have to say it's a great watch. And it's priced right. Okay. So right that they can't supposedly cannot make enough of them to match the demand. Right. So a watch, you know, that's what is it supposed to be? 
twelve thousand or something. Twelve thousand eight hundred. Yeah. Or no, I think it's just under eleven or it's ten. Ten. What is that? Actually, are you looking it up? Yeah, I'm gonna look it up. Instarolex.com. Yeah, so. Pepsi GMT. Rolex World of Watches. Let's share the screen. Here we go. I mean, there's a GMT, but it's not a Pepsi. Oh, they all root for you. Yeah, so I know someone that just got this watch not too long ago. Boy, oh boy, is it heavy. I got to say, the update to the root beer, even if it's in steel and gold, the Everose gold hands, the Everose gold GMT hand, it is a really, really pretty watch. Like, you know, yeah, I was, I didn't think I'd be a fan of that. And I saw it in person. I was like, oh, huh. Right. Yeah. Not, Not too shabby. Yep. So anyway, great watches for the MSRP. But when they start getting ridiculous with the prices, uh, either secondhand or through gray market dealers and things like that, right? it starts to make less and less sense. Yeah, 9700 by the way. Because I wouldn't be looking at one for the name. Um, so there's the option of alternatives if, if you're not going for it just for the name. Right. I think there's a lot of great alternatives. You know, one of them is getting an Omega Aquaterra. I knew you were going to say that. And <laughs> taking 20 grand and paying your mortgage down a little bit. <laughs> you know, I think that would be a, a, a great thing. Get a watch with the money you save on interest on your mortgage. <laughs> okay. And I, I love that the, um, it's not the Aquaterra, but the Planet Ocean, they have the black and white bezel. Yeah, Planet which Ocean, I think is white. Let's see. Okay, pretty, pretty. It's a cool touch. I don't know. I think it it is a really pretty watch. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're getting places. We're getting places. All right. So let me share the screen here and see what these alternatives are. So number one, we'll talk about the Planet Ocean. So let's see with the blue and black dial. I mean, it, it, I can't find it right now. But use your use your imagination, people. It's just black and white. What did we pull up here? It's the Planet Ocean. GMT. G- we need the, the GMT. And you'll see it. It's just this black and white superstar. Oh, there, you go. there it is. There it is. Yeah. Uh, it's an Omega. And uh, it's black and white. <laughs> uh, let's see what else we got. So we were talking about the Aqua Terra. Aqua Terra. I actually prefer. I actually really like Aqua Terrace. I like yeah, I think the uh, one thing I, I think is great about the Aquaterra is that mm-hmm. textured dial mm. with the striping on it. Right. Yep. So if you if you haven't seen one of these in person, I highly recommend going down to your local store um, or just trying to find some some close up pictures of the dial. But that striping on the dial is really nice. Yep. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, the Aqua are cool. I really like. Uh, <clears throat> well, excuse me. I really like. Um, so did you did you get ahead. up there? I didn't. Yeah, here it is. Pull so up the Aqua There we go. Now there's there's other versions. I I like the one with the 24 hour bezel. Okay, uh, so in blue. 24 hour bezel. But that's just my personal choice. In the blue. Is this the one? No. Mm, can't seem to find it. All right. Well, I'll look for it, and if you see it on your screen, there, let me know. Do you? You don't. But anyway, have to, they have. Yeah. That's the thing with Omega. They have so many different versions of the same thing that it ends up losing its identity a little bit, which right. I think is why Rolex does a, does better with that uh, brand name recognition. Yeah. This one's cool. The World Timer. It's not a GMT, is it? Yeah. yeah. I think it's a GMT. Okay, whatever. All right. Well, we've got uh, a couple of examples of substitutes for the GMT. Do we have anything else? Well, I want to know from Cameron, because I know one of the big things with the GMT Master 2 is it is a true GMT complication, and it's decoupling of the 24-hour hand. <laughs> okay yeah so so this this gets a little 
particular. Um, and as far as modern day watches go, I don't know the exact watches that are out in the marketplace that offer the same, what people call a true GMT, uh, which is what the Rolex movement is. Um, as far as older versions of timepieces, the, the one that's super obvious is the old Seamaster uh, GMT, mm -hmm. which I, I talked about it on our last episode. It is um, an amazing value. They made so many of them, so they're not rare. You can find them easily. I'm sure there's got to be at least five to ten of them on Crown & Caliber right now. Um, but like I said, I'm holding out for a Jerry Lopez version uh, <laughs> if I can find one with box and papers. So, Nate, if you see one roll through the uh, Crown & Caliber headquarters, let me know. <laughs> But that also is a true GMT. Um, now, a good alternative that I know of would also be Blanc Pan. I knew you were going to say Blanc Pan. They make too. a true GMT that is based on the, oh, I forget what, like a, let's see what their caliber is. And when you're looking it up, Cam, will you explain to everyone what makes a GMT a true GMT? Yeah. So it has to do with basically setting your GMT and then quick corrections of it. So real quick, let me grab a GMT so I can go through it. All awesome. right. I love that you're like, let me just go grab one. <laughs> <laughs> And while you're doing that, I want to find an alternative on my own here because I am scrolling through Crown and Caliber site to see if there's some GMTs that I like, and I don't. Not you know, yet. Ah, you know what would be a great alternative to a Rolex GMT Master 2? Mm -hmm. Is an early 2000s Rolex GMT Master 2. Oh, you're pitting a Rolex against a Rolex. But yeah, well, you'll save quite a bit of money there. But seriously, I mean, uh, you're you're sacrificing the super case, um, solid bracelet, and a ceramic bezel. But uh, other than that, you're getting that name brand recognition that you probably desire. Do you have a reference number for that? A one six seven one zero. One six seven one zero. One six seven one zero. Man, you um, are the king of reference numbers. So you can get it in a Pepsi, you can get it in a Coke, and you can get it in a black. Right, yep. And if you get one from 2001 onward, you have solid end length bracelet. So you're a step closer to the, you know, the more modern day with the full solid bracelet. But like that watch right there, mm -hmm. pretty solid pick. So, yeah, you know, and, and a lot of people may not know that if they're just so sought after the, the Pepsi, they may not realize, hey, I can go, you know, 10, 12 years removed and get one. Right. The fraction of the cost. But back to what you were saying, Cam, that just popped in my head. Yeah. Cam, before right, you, so you carry on it, you know, what's funny is like the GMT, the Rolex GMT, it's such a sought after model that you would think that other manufacturers would manufacture something to compete with it. But there really isn't that much. I mean, like Tag Heuer Formula One, but it doesn't, it doesn't, you know. Yeah, and so what all. you've got with this true GMT, uh, true GMT function, you've got a watch that an actual traveler is going to use uh, as opposed to, you know, you, you stay home and you're trying to figure out what time it is elsewhere. Maybe you're calling people, uh in China all the time doing business, or you're calling people in Europe all the time doing business. You want to know what time it is there easily, but it's different if you are the actual traveler and you're the one changing destinations and you're thinking, well, what time is it at home? So that's the first thing you got to kind of think about. Um, and if you're saying I want a GMT watch because I travel a lot, then it's going to be easier if you get one that is true GMT. Okay. And, what that means is, let's see if we can see this. This is a GMT with the red hand being 
your 24 hour hand. You can see on here, it says uh, 915 basically. Right. And that is my, basically my traveling time. That's the time that I'm going off at my location. The GMT hand, the red one, will tell me what time it is at home. I happen to be at home and this happens to not be set to home, but that doesn't really matter. What matters is when you travel, you can simply pull out your crown and you can jump back or forth, back or forth, forwards or back, no matter where you're traveling and change your current time very easily. Okay. So if you're in LA and you happen to travel to New York, you just quick set three hours forward. Good to go. And your red hand, your GMT will stay where it is. So you will know what time it is at home. Uh, that function makes it much easier to use if you are traveling a lot. Okay. And it doesn't stop the watch from running. Right. So the watch is still yeah. keeps the time. So it's Exactly. Yeah. So that function, a lot of people, when they talk about GMTs, uh, especially if they're talking about the Rolex, the reason that that one does well is because it is true GMT and there's not a lot of alternatives in the market right now, modern day watches that are true GMTs. Um, but this movement here is in production and you can get a true GMT from Blanc Um, and honestly, it's going to cost you less money than the uh, than a modern Rolex if you if you buy one of them. <laughs> right. Well, I think there is one alternative. Like Nate, you gave the um, the sixteen was seven ten. What was the reference number on it? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you gave that as an alternative, but I have. I, yeah. It just came to my mind. Like, what about? But again, not not modern day. Right. 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 But relatively. I mean, it's somewhat contemporary. It's what like twenty years old. Yeah. Yeah. So it's. Yeah, but we're talking about like brand the reason you don't get the Rolex is because you walk into the Rolex store and they won't even put you on the list to buy it. Right. So right. the only way to get it is to go pay twice the price from some gray market person or buy it second hand, but still pay twice the price. Yeah. Sorry. Right. Or, yeah. or an Explorer two. So you're still not going to be able to find it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but a pre owned it. just like with Nate's, uh, you know, uh, what is it again? One, seven, six, seven, whatever. The, uh, the, the, uh, the older Pepsi. No, you guys are not. Yeah. Okay. All right, fine. Whatever. I'm so not a big fan these of these are all anyway. Yeah. All great <laughs> options. Uh, the one thing you're not going to have with that watch is your, your rotating bezel as well. Right. So, whoop. so being able to rotate your bezel, you won't have that option, uh, unless you get the GMT master two or another watch, mm -hmm. uh, from a competing brand. Right. You know, when, when you pull up that Blanc Pond, I just like the, the, the direct competitor to that Blanc, Blanc Pond for me is the Yacht Master, just because of the bezel. It just looks so similar that I just, that's yeah. all I see is a Yacht Master. It definitely has a Yacht Master bezel. Um, I think that was their intent at the time. Okay. Was to use that recognizable bezel and go for it. Um, Again, this watch, though, the movement that's in it is a fantastic movement. 100-hour power reserve. You do not get that with Rolex. <laughs> Even though the Rolex is a, a watch that is uh, 20 years newer, Yeah, you don't get that. Yeah. Yeah. I get the feeling that you're trying to hype up the, uh, the value on these things so that you could uh, get yeah. rid of it and purchase yourself a brand new contemporary version of uh, the Rolexes that we were discussing. <laughs> No, you know, I, <laughs> I would go for for a vintage GMT Master Two. Okay, but uh, I, I think if I was to get another GMT, it would be that Omega, the okay. Omega Seamaster GMT. I think that is a that's the obvious choice mm -hmm. if you're trying to find something that is well priced. And well, you won't find one new, I don't think, mm -hmm. uh, unless you happen to be lucky and you, you stumble on some new old stock because this is an older watch. Right. Well, you don't have to buy it new. All you have to do is go to crownandcaliber.com, scroll through, and buy your dang old watch. So that, there it is. 
All right. Well, do we have anything else that we want to add? Because that that completes our list here. I can't think of anything else. Okay. We are done, I mean, apparently. If, if you're not going the true GMT route, there's a lot of other smaller brands that you're going to find powered by an ETA movement. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and it's essentially like a, um, a 2824 movement that has an additional complication for a second time zone. Okay. But it's not what we call true GMT, which it will allow you to track a second time zone, but it's not going to be so simple, the switching back and forth. Uh but like I said, if you're always calling people in New York and you just want to quickly take a look at your watch and say, oh, it's too late. You know, they're eating dinner now. They're not working anymore. Uh, those are great watches and really reasonable. You can find them, you know, just over $1,000, maybe even slightly under $1,000. Hmm. Um, what are you talking about, like Hamilton's or something of, like that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Hamilton would be a good example. Yeah, let's take a look. Uh, I think Alpina makes oh, yeah. some really nice looking and well-priced GMTs. Let's pull Is there up. just a, uh, a level of difficulty in producing a true GMT? Is that why we see it so um, far less than we do just the yes. 24 hour hand? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the reason that it's not in manufacture currently on a large scale other than with Rolex is the fact that it does require uh, more change to your base caliber to make it work. And those changes are too expensive to justify the mm. price point for most of the GMT offerings out there. Okay. Makes sense. Uh, and what that basically says is that, you know, the customer wants a GMT but is not willing to spend a few thousand dollars more for the true GMT. They would prefer to just spend a hundred or two hundred dollars more for that extra hand. And the way to do that is with a simpler alteration to the movement, which does not create a true GMT, but it creates a second time zone. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Cool. So we've got all the information. It sounds like. All right. <laughs> okay. All right, gentlemen. I guess this is the time where we say goodbye. So. Nathan, since you're our guest, you want to tell people where they can find all your Splendiferous videos? Oh, yeah, absolutely. If you go to youtube.com slash crown and caliber, you can see a whole lot of my face, <laughs> talk a whole lot about watches, and mispronouncing most of them. That's awesome. <laughs> okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch just for the mispronunciations. I like that. Yeah. So that I can be in the same camp and feel good about myself. Yep. Cameron, shoot. Cameron M. Weiss on Instagram or Weiss Watch Company on Instagram. Uh, and head over to our website too, WeissWatchCompany.com. M. Weiss? I didn't know that. You had a middle name? Uh, yeah, I have you a middle not, name. Not had. <laughs> have. You have a middle name? I said had. I don't know why I said had. I, I, it's funny because yeah, I've been following you so long that I've never actually noticed that it's Cameron M. Weiss. Yeah, apparently Cameron Weiss is a, a more common name than I would have thought. Head on over to Weiss Watch, head on over to Crown and Caliber, buy yourself some damn watches, people. Uh, for me, very simple, at Road Stories Mike. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening. Subscribe to the show wherever it is that you're listening. Make sure to, on YouTubes, press that little bell thingy so that you know when our watch, uh, watch videos come out. And uh, thanks so much for supporting. We'll see you guys in the next one.